Hello, and, and first of all, it's very nice to see old friends and old, old colleagues again, if you see what I mean. Um, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to participate um, in this event celebrating your new school. And I feel very privileged to be invited. Before I start, I'm very aware of the work achieved by, the, by this university in the field of IPE over the past few years. And I feel it's very important to um, recognise and to acknowledge this. And I wanted to say that right at the beginning. Um, the title of my presentation is Taking the Interprofessional Agenda Forward. Uh, during my presentation, I'd like to describe briefly a couple of significant events in my own interprofessional education journey and really helping you to understand the perspective that I'm coming from. But also to clarify what I mean by IPE, because still different people mean different things. And then present my perspective on um, evidence for IPE. I'd then like to go on to introduce the concept of values-based practice um, and how this can be applied to IPE share my thinking about the importance of um, IPE in the practice environment and explain my thinking about, pro about professional identities um, and the importance for the preparation of IPE teachers. Finally, I'd like to, to present some recommendations from a very recently published uh, IP, IPE review and right at the end, suggest ways that uh, CAPE, the, the Centre of the Advancement of Interprofessional Education, can help. Now, I think there have been two events that have significantly informed my personal IPE journey. And before I was first involved in IPE, I was very sceptical about IPE, and I didn't really appreciate what all the fuss was about. I thought I was already involved in the process, and anyway, we've been doing it for years. And as for teaching, well, I was an experienced undergraduate medical teacher. I was an experienced postgraduate medical teacher for many years. And I felt there was unlikely to be much difference between monoprofessional teaching and interprofessional teaching. But my experience was to be very different. What I thought was IPE was in fact groups of different professionals side by side, coming together in a lecture theatre for didactic learning. There was no interaction between the professionals and there was no focus on the patient or the service user. I found that my teaching skills were stretched to the absolute maximum and I found myself dealing with negativity, jealousy, anger and a focus that was more on interprofessional boundaries than on the patient and on service users. Something important was going on for which I and my fellow IPE teachers didn't fully understand and we were totally unprepared for it. Now the second significant event happened much later down the line and it was the writing of an EDD thesis here at the University of Brighton with the help of my two, two supervisors, Professors Val Hall and Avril Lovelace. Before starting, I would describe myself as having, by that time, developed a naive enthusiasm for IPE. But actually, the experience of doing the EDD here at the, the University of Brighton moulded my initial enthusiasm more into a, a, a moderated, informed, but yet still a deeply held passion. And it was this philosophy developed here at the University of Brighton that I was later informed by my CAPE colleagues that contributed to me being elected to the chair of CAPE. In summary, I would say that these two experiences catalyzed a fascination for IPE and a deeply held respect for the University of Brighton. So, what do we mean by IPE? The generally accepted national and international definition of IPE is that by CAPE uh, that was cited in 2002 and that's interprofessional education or IPE occurs when two or more professions learn from about an, uh, um, with from and about each other to improve collaboration and the quality of care and I suppose for me the important bits 
are the fact that it's two or more professions. But very importantly, there's an interreaction. It's, it's with, from, and about each other. And through improving collaborative working, through improving team working, it focuses on the quality of care, on the patient, on the service user, uh, and the experience that the patient has. I think it's quite important to, to, to say that um, in this context, IPE is taken as including all learning in the university environment, in the academic environment, but also in practice-based settings. It also includes pre-qualifying IPE, and it includes post-qualifying IPE. And something actually which you might think that this definition is not a particularly good one, and that is that the term professions is very encompassing. It actually relates to all those in health and social care who look after um, patients, service users, and their carers. So why should one move towards an agenda of the future? What is the evidence for doing all of this? Much of the evidence of IPE stems from a series of national shortcomings, which in turn resulted in a series of inquiries. And examples of that, very pertinent to us, was the inquiry around Maria Cobble in Brighton in 1974, probably the first of them. And then the Butler Sloss report in Cleveland, the Kennedy report, the first of the Laming reports around Victoria Climbier, the Smith report on Harold Shipman, the second Laming report on Baby P. Now, all these emphasised that an important factor in all these cases was a breakdown in communication between different professional groups and between professional groups and the service users. And two in particular, the Kennedy report and the first of the Laming reports emphasised the importance in this context of different professionals learning together. Now, more recently, there was the Francis report in 2013. And given the extensive uh, um, pre-media coverage, uh, um, we all knew um, what the content was going to be about. But still, the, the critique was shocking. There were 290 recommendations in the Francis report, um, and none made explicit recommendations to IPE. But the implications for IPE were widely picked up in both education and in practice. The Kia report, again in 2013, it emphasised the, the need for communication and openness throughout the entire NHS. No hospital should be an island unto itself. And professional, academic and managerial isolation should become a thing of the past. The report that I felt that was really positive was the Berwick report. And this emphasised the importance of initial preparation and lifelong learning for all healthcare professionals throughout the NHS. And it emphasised how this should be linked firmly to the quality of patient care and to patient safety. So, recent IPE reviews and literature. Now, I think tracking down isolated evaluations about IPE is not enough. Sustained and systematic searches are needed to provide a baseline for future policy. Now, there have been three Cochrane reviews on IPE over the past few years. And the most recent of these, done by Scott Reeves and his team in 2013, it comprised, um, it only included 15 studies. But findings from these three Cochrane reviews over the years are often cited as there being very little evidence for the effectiveness of IPE. However, Hugh Barr and his team obtained advice from Professor Michael Arrow at the University of Sussex. And they came to the conclusion that the Cochrane methodology was intended to co um, conduct meta-analysis of medical interventions. And this was ill-suited for educational interventions. And to quote um, Olsen and his colleague in 2014, there is a struggle between the assumptions underpinning biomedical and health sciences and those under underpinning education studies. And I found a fascinating article by Hadara et al, which is written in 2000. And this suggested that IPE is not a single coherent idea, uh, idea in medical education and in healthcare. 
that two different discourses exist, and each has its own language, its own truths, and its own objects. And this very much relates to my experience as a health professional coming in to do an NED for the first time in the Department of Education here at the University of Brighton. My first year was taken learning the language of education, learning the discourse of education. So the extent to which educators and healthcare practitioners may tacitly align themselves with either one discourse or another may possibly explain the tensions that have accompanied the planning, the implementation and the assessment of IPE. And I think that acknowledgement and attention to these two discourses is important to improve coherence and to improve impact. Now Barr and his team, Hugh Barr and his team in 2005, conducted a far more inclusive but no less rigorous systematic review and this took into account a much wider range of qualitative and quantitative methodologies. And these were reported on in 2005 and again in 2007. And these outcomes were mapped onto a modified Kirkpatrick scale. This model presents outcomes as you go down in increasing levels of complexity each of which depends on the achievement of previous levels. Now, Hugh Barr's review included 107 evaluations, and it found evaluations of undergraduate IPE relevant to positive changes in attitudes, acquisition of knowledge and skills relevant to collaborative practice. So this really, I think, is going up to level 2B. And this indeed was backed up by um, a recent paper by Lapkin et al. in 2013. But Hugh Barr also found that evaluations of post-qualifying IPE reported changes in individual and organisational behaviours and a benefit to practice. And this really is going up to round about 4A. And again, there was a recent paper by Sokolinum um, in 2000. 2014, which backed up um, this thinking. Meanwhile, the, the implications are that well-planned undergraduate IPE meets these intermediate objectives, but this is not enough, and foundations laid have to be built upon. And I would suggest that pre-qualifying and post-qualifying IPE should be seen as a continuum rather than two separate entities. Now I'd like to move on to values-based practice. In this context, I'm using the word values as that defined by Jill Thistlethwaite, as a belief, a mission, a motivating force, an ideal or a philosophy and that has meaning for the individual concerned. But we are not always aware of our values. Our values are deep down. Now, Jill Thistlethwaite, um, who's now based in Australia, in a recent book, applied the principles of values-based practice to IPE and collaborative working. Now, the way that I see this is that, coming from a medical background, I was brought up on evidence-based practice. But I actually found when I was faced with an individual patient in my consulting room, sometimes the evidence base became less relevant. What was missing was the human factor. And I believe it's this human factor that can be related to values-based practice. And this, I suggest, can link science with people and can be the basis of person-centred care. A health professional student can absorb prof professional values through example role modelling. And also what, what we call the, the hidden curriculum, which you all know about. The professional identity of students is rooted in these values. Um, and it's this that informs how they communicate, what they say about each other, their interpersonal skills, and their attitudes to, to, to teamwork. 
And some students need to be facilitated to consider these values and how their behaviour impacts not only upon patient care, but also on their colleagues. So the way that I see it is that, in summary, values-based practice, along with evidence-based practice, underpins, for example, balanced decision-making by health and social care teams and service users. Decision-making is enriched when the values of all concerned are integrated. And at the very heart of values-based practice is interprofessional partnership, whereby people work effectively together, contributing not only through their skills and their experience, but also more deeply through their insights and their values-based perspectives. And I think this theme lends itself to many relevant interprofessional sub-themes. For example, patient safety, compassion, person-centred care, ethical dilemmas, and all these in turn are enriched through interprofessional learning with a focus always on service users and carers. I'd like to do a quick plug here. Um, every two years, the World Coordinating Committee of um, Interprofessional Education holds an international Altogether Better Health conference. In fact, the last one has just taken place a few weeks ago in Pittsburgh. Now, the next conference is being held in 2016, and it's going to be jointly hosted by Oxford Brookes University, University of Oxford, and ourselves, CAPE. And the overarching theme is going to be values-based practice. I'd like to talk a little bit now about the importance, or how, how I see the importance, of IPE in practice settings. Historically, there have been four main expectations for IPE in practice settings over the past few years. One has been resolving strained relationships, and early initiatives focused a lot on repairing relationships between professions that impeded progress. And with constructive relationships, collaborative practice was assumed, um, and it was assumed that would follow and that patients would benefit. The second expectation over the years has been developing teamwork. Work-based interprofessional learning tended to be either team-based or team-related. And the purpose was to develop the team and, moving on to the third point, establishing, extending and improving care and services. Now, the uh, um, fourth expectation uh, of IP in practice has been safeguarding patients. And protecting patients from harm is implicit in improving care and services. But it wasn't really until the turn of this century that it really came into much sharper relief. So I'd now like to describe some of the outcomes of IPE in the practice setting relating to patient safety. Because I, think, I feel this is a particularly important area at the present time. Patient safety... Um, is based on effective communication, collaboration and coordination. And hence it's a shared responsibility between professions. Now there is now evidence starting to show that learning together can enhance patient safety. And examples that I found in the literature have included um, obstetricians and midwives working on the labour ward, reducing errors on the labour ward. Um, physicians, nurse practitioners uh, and pharmacists learning together, re reducing errors in prescribing. In the States, they showed that when they brought together health and social care and the criminal justice system, that usually in the States work quite separately, when they brought them together and they learned together, they showed they could reduce the mortality rate um, related to domestic violence. It's been shown that uh, um, errors in operating theatres can be reduced um, by using checklists, not by using checklists as a means to an end, but as they do in the aviation industry, using checklists um, more to, to promote an interprofessional discussion. And in the, sta in the States, Peter um, Pronovost in Johns Hopkins showed that intensive care units um, using IPE amongst the team could reduce the mortality rate from um, infected central venous lines.
So I'd like to talk a little bit now about professional identities and preparing the teachers. Effective IPE requires teachers that are well prepared and well supported. And in a minute I'd like to present a model that relates different professional identities to teacher preparation. Now in this context, I'm using professional identity as the presence of attributes or characteristics that are required for all those engaged in the work of professional groups involved with health and social care. Now I'd like to use the metaphor of an iceberg to relate values to identities and to storytelling. Most of the iceberg is deep underwater and is not seen. And this relates to our values, which also, on the whole, aren't seen. But our values are fundamental to our personal and professional identity. And this identity, in turn, can sometimes be glimpsed at just through the surface of the water. But these, in turn, inform the content of our narrative and our stories and the way in which our stories are told. And it's these that are visible above the surface of the water and are far more accessible. And I suggest that reflection, particularly on storytelling, is one way of engaging identities and values and allowing deeper learning to occur. Now, undergraduate students commence their journey with a personal identity in the top left-hand corner. And as they progress through their undergraduate course, so they gradually develop a professional identity. As they become more senior, so they start to, to develop an interprofessional identity. And with this is accompanied a more receptive response to IPE. Now this integration of personal identity and professional identity is a very important part of this process. Now once qualified, New practitioners will often experience a job for which they've not been fully prepared. They are required to develop a mature professional identity and need to become independent learning professionals with the skills of reflection and feedback, enabling, enabling them to learn in practice. Now, at the stage of a mature professional identity, which is on the right-hand side going down towards the um, the lower circle. At the stage of mature professional identity, many become experts in their own field, developing the identity of mono-professional teachers. Now, in my experience, it's these teachers that are often involved with IPE. But many at this stage have not had the time or the opportunity to develop their interprofessional identity. And I think this is particularly the case um, with my colleagues in the medical profession. And this can produce significant tension and anger towards interprofessional issues, and this can be communicated unintentionally to students. What is not generally recognised is that to become an effective IPE teacher, individuals need to develop an interprofessional identity. And if this step is not taken into account, then unanticipated difficulties can occur which by blocking development can be a recipe for disaster. I'd like to finally mention, um, I'd like to present the results of a, a very comprehensive um, IPE review that's only been published actually in the last six weeks. And it's been, been written by three independent authors, Barr, Helm and Davry. Um, it focuses on IPE taking place in pre-qualifying courses in health and social care throughout the entire UK between 1997 and 2013. And it draws on three sources, literature, online surveys and reflective accounts from invited teachers with follow-up interviews. Now, in my naivety, I rather felt there'd been so much time spent, spent on our IPE and emphasis on IPE in the undergraduate world that it was pretty much sorted. Actually, there are a lot of problems there, as I'm sure you're, you're, you're more than aware. 
The first thing is that during the period under review, two thirds of UK universities with qualifying courses in health and social care included IPE. Now that astounded me because I actually thought it'd be much more than that. The main finding was that realignment with and between professional courses to implant IPE is overdue. Synchronizing interprofessional assessment and synchronizing learning on placements was especially problematic. Now this review, uh, which you can, can access um, uh, uh, in its totality on, on the CAPE website, um, th this review presents a series of detailed recommendations that are made to regulatory bodies, to universities, to commissioners of professional education and to service providers. And the main recommendations to universities can really be summarised as follows. There should be a requirement for universities to demonstrate how all teachers will be prepared and supported for IPE teaching. There should be a requirement for universities to demonstrate in validation and, re and in review documentation on how their professional courses are being aligned to optimise IPE, especially in regard to timetabling and to placement patterns. Now, this includes making sure that all relevant professions are participating fully and how obstacles can be overcome. It includes synchronising procedures for validation and review where two or more courses contain the same IPE. It includes members of validating and visiting panels being briefed in advance about IPE and ensuring that at least one member of the panel has first-hand IPE experience. The third recommendation is a requirement for universities to develop and implement consist consistent procedures and criteria for assessment of IPE across all professions. And the fourth one um, was a requirement for universities where they're involved in IPE learning to make sure they combine and align e-learning with face-to-face -face learning. So, where does CAPE stand in all of this? Well, CAPE, as has been mentioned before, is the Centre for the Advancement of Interprofessional Education, and it was founded in 1987 um, by um, Dr John Horder, who was a, a well-known um, GP at that time. It's a UK organisation and a charity which is dedicated to the promotion and the development of interprofessional education. And it consists of individual members, student members and corporate members. And corporate members, we've, we've got at the moment about 25, 26 corporate members that are mostly universities, but some are let to be, some are hospital trusts. And we've also got, got uh, members abroad in, in Japan uh, and also in the States. What corporate membership to Kate, which I gather you're in the process now of, uh, of, of taking out, it offers access by all staff um, to Cape online resources. And this includes the Journal of Interprofessional Care, uh, which CAPE very much supports. And also our monthly e-bulletin, which updates you on the latest news on, on IPE and IPE activities. It raises the profile of university corporate members through dissemination of IPE activities in teaching, learning and, very importantly, research. It includes membership of a CAPE forum, um, which is a meeting that occurs occurs twice a year for all corporate members um, and this provides opportunities for regional, national and international networking, sharing ideas, exchanging visits and more recently um, collaborating with research. We've, we've done a fair amount of that. CAPE also offers advice and assistance uh, for the developing of IPE courses and practice-based initiatives uh, and each uh, um, corporate member has a nominated board member as a link. Separate from that, CAPE can also um, offer support and guidance on organising other interprofessional and interagency events. And this includes the development of jointly run sem um, seminars, workshops or conferences in collaboration with CAPE. And finally, CAPE enables contribution to, to the de development of the wider IPE community 
by influencing national and international policies through CAPE's consultation process and responding to various policy documentations that arise. Now, in conclusion, I would say that whilst I feel that IPE and collaborative working is not the panacea of all ills, I think it is particularly relevant to the changes taking place in health and social care at the present time. And I'm delighted to hear that there's an interprofessional element in the, the development of your new school. And I'd like to wish you all the very best for the future. Thank you very much.